Hi, hi, how's it going? Um, so this is my um, video blog um, to talk about David Jones's in parenthesis. It's a war poem from the Great War, World War One, by David Jones, who is actually a, a private in the uh, Royal Welsh Fusiliers. So I think he was from Kent, and he was um, an art student um, who joined up and went to fight, like most of the people in the country. And kind of the real thing with him is that he's one of the only war poets that um, came from the private class, really. Most ones you know, or well, the most famous ones, like Siegfried Sassoon and Robert Graves, who uh, survived and went on to greater things, and Wilfred Owen, who died, unfortunately, um, in 1918, I think. They were officers, they were all officer class. Um, whilst Jones wasn't, uh, he was possibly of a sort of virgin in middle class back then, um, he was still very kind of um, low down in the ranks. As a result, this this work of his, which is an epic work, you can see it's not a few pages, it's a book. Like I said in my last blog, it's up there with, I, I would say, um, the Iliad <clears throat> or anything, you know, any of these classic poems. Like I'm not an expert on poetry, I can't, I don't profess to write it. You know, I know a couple of people who do and even people that get up in public and recite and stuff, which is awesome. And I don't really get involved, I don't understand it so much. And when you see something like a work of genius, essentially like this, um, you can sort of see why, because it's this is like next level poetry, basically. This is like pretty intense and in depth. Subsequently, I think it's been, um, it's not as famous as the others because it's a lot harder to get into and to possibly appreciate surface level but really when you dig into it it's just amazing it's brilliant what i was thinking i could do is maybe find some cool bits and just like point out why i think it's so cool see one of the things one of the first things about it really is that it's not it is about the horror of war but it's so beautifully like constructed that it's a, it's a lot more than that it's really about innocence it's really about losing innocence and a sort of camaraderie that was then from essentially when they join up, they go out to France and then um, it all builds up to the Battle of the Somme, which is kind of where it ends, where his unit is essentially slaughtered in the Battle of the Somme. It, was in, it started in July 1916 and um, it, it was a, eventually, it did actually succeed, I think, after about six months of fierce fighting. Um, but the basic idea was to advance across the German lines, kick them out, uh, it was a <clears throat> joint offensive with the French down south and the uh, British up north um, <clears throat> around, the, around the Somme area. <clears throat> Obviously, the, it's famous in, in Britain for being possibly the worst ever day, I think, uh, July the 1st, 1916, on the morning of it. I think nearly 60,000 people died um, in those hours. <clears throat> um, or a wound, wounded, I can't quite remember the exact figures, but it was a horrendous amount. And there's been, you know, there's loads of things about the Somme and the tactics used, and and there's great literature as well. One of my favourite books, Birdsong by Sebastian Falk, is a brilliant, brilliant book about um, the First World War. And it's got just a great fictional, visceral description of the battle. That, um, you know, if you're a fiction writer, it's pretty quite difficult to, to better, but, you know, I'm sure people can do it. Um, whereas the difference with this is, is that it's an eyewitness account, you know, and it's... But what's so beautiful about it, and I'm sorry for rambling on, but I do love it, and I'm quite passionate about it, but... Is that it's, um... Take Wilfred Owen... Um, I take any Wilfred Owen poem, they're quite short, and they're, um... They're very, uh, political, they're almost like, um... Very biting, they're like... One of the things, maybe along with Kipling's line about if they ask us why we died, tell them that our fathers lied. It's very moving and it sort of sums up the whole war really well. Whereas there's no like sound bites in here basically. But when you consider like Kipling um, was very pro war until his son John died around um, 1916, 15. Um, and he wasn't really fit to serve either. He had um, myopia. He had some kind of thing where he shouldn't have been um, allowed to serve. but his father, Rudyard Kipling, um, was so pro, such an imperialist and so pro war that uh, in 1914 that he, he pulled strings to get him to go to war. And then he died and Kipling was broken by this. And he changed his entire view on it. And um, 
he wrote this really poignant poem which had that line in it which is now extremely famous and obviously it's, it's quite brilliant in the way it sums up in such a short line the whole thing whereas what david jones going back to david jones he's not so concerned about that he's more concerned he's got an artist mind he's very he's like an artist he is an artist i think you can see his art in the tate gallery maybe he this is written by an artist you can tell this is written by an artist who's been put into this situation it crosses sort of um welsh or british folklore into it it's very clever it's a time of year where we should be remembering this and i believe remembrance day is you know about remembering these people that were essentially set up by political powers to slaughter each other and it shouldn't ever happen again and it, it's not about celebrating war or people fighting it's about um, remembering sacrifices people had to make without any choice um, because they were lied to they were completely lied to by by the authorities in charge at the time another subject is quite close to my heart because I've got a fairly famous um, ancestor um, who was quite a leader in the uh, founding of the labor movement in uh, in Britain who was a uh, strong anti-war um, first world war demonstrator he's a conscientious objective he went to the Tower of London because he was um and he was like ostracized by he's like everyone for years but I, I have a lot of respect for him his name's Fenner Brockway if you're interested in uh check him out online he did a lot uh, for the labor movement in the UK so you know this is a subject that's quite close to my heart um, but more than that um <clears throat> my nan my granddad the other side of the family they he was like really well off compared to most of my family. He was like a half brother. He wasn't really involved. Nowhere we knew him because he was like a different class. I found that out. I was a teenager. I was a bit disappointed when I asked my nan about. It. I was all really excited, and she was like, "Yeah, no, nah, we were too poor for him <laughs> to even like bother with." And I was like, "Oh, that's a shame." But yeah, that's a completely different subject. But the fact is, like my other side of the family were <clears throat> fighting in the trenches. They were with David Jones' position, and I'm. Um, that war, as I said in my previous blog, um, vlog, totally like fascinates me and horrifies me, and I'm kind of a bit obsessed by it. Um, and this First World War is it just because of it, it's such a mess, basically, that it really did. It really moves me thinking about being stuck in that situation. And I feel if I was there, I'd probably end up doing something like this. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, I wouldn't even dream that it would be as good as this, <laughs> or anything like as good as this. Like I say, I think the real beauty of this is it's really about um, innocence and the loss of innocence. Not in necessarily in a personal sense, but in a societal sense, in a, a very fundamental sense. It's not even betrayal. Like I say, with Owen, you'll get like a real underlying of betrayal by the by the people above. You know, like it's almost like a like a brotherly thing. He's almost like looking after his the people he sees lower and the bleak bleak world and he's kind of really annoyed that everyone's been set up like this whereas David Jones I think he wrote this 20 odd years after the war and I think it's more reflective and it's more um it's more like a story basically what he does is he centers around a main character he's called John Ball John Ball is um a British imperial british um thing symbol that they used to use a lot especially in napoleonic times and around that you know um in the 19th century but he was britain personified basically um but he was always quite a <clears throat> um he was like a hard figure almost like a, a bulldog type figure kind of quite a an, you know a hard figure say in napoleonic times you might have a cartoon of um napoleon or get up backside by um by john bull after waterloo that kind of thing so but what David Jones does is he makes John Bull a private in the uh, infantry. Essentially, he's every man. He's every man. That's who John Bull is. He's every British person. Well, you can see already that there's a little bit of genius there because it's kind of like, like I say, loss of innocence, loss of almost identity, I suppose. So <clears throat> he messes about with his ideas of British folklore and history and culture and stuff like this, you see. So... Here's a little section. I'm just going to read three of my favourite sections. So, the first one is about in the part two. It's quite early on, and they're, they're, they're sort of um, get you know they've commandeered a, a French uh, barn barn house thing, and all the all the troops down there, 
and the British camp sets up essentially the British headquarters. Um, John Ball is um, he meets one of the officers, um, or Jenkins. It's written in a very kind of um, bitty way. So, um, so it's all right in here, comfortable. Let them get some rest. We parade at five o'clock. Scattered recumbent around the walls within, they listened with eagerness. The truth stole upon them. That night would be spent in some other place. The more contriving had already sought out nails and hooks on which to hang their gear for the night, and to arrange, as best they might, their allotted flooring. They would make order for however brief time and in whatever wilderness. Anyway, get what rest you can. I'll be along at 4.30. Yes, everything, I'm afraid. There was talk of dumping valises. Yes, we're taking them in. I think greatcoats folded. They may change that. Waterproof capes worn. Very good, sir. Oh, I forgot. There will be a rifle inspection in an hour's time. Yes, yes, at 3.45. I see, sir. I'll get them on their rifles at once. Sergeant Snell's salute had not to it the usual perfection. Some sleep if you can, Sergeant. He walked slowly across the yard, meeting John Ball at the gate, carrying a mess tin of water. Have you a match, Ball? Confusedly, he put his mess tin down to search his pockets. Mr Jenkins tapped the end of the cigarette on a broken gatepost. His head turned away and towards the lane, towards the shielded batteries, towards the sagging camouflage. The jaunty bombardier came, came again for the water, his tunic on, and the day was getting colder. His chill fingers, clumsy at full trouser pockets, scattered on the stones. One flattened candle end, two centon pieces, pallid silver sixpence a length of pink orderly rope room tape, a latch key. The two young men together glanced where it lay incongruous, bright between the sets. Keys of Stondon Park. His father has its twin in the office in Knight Rider Street. Keys of Stondon Park in French farmyard. Stupid bull. It's no use here. So far from complying, it's so far from its complying lock. Locks for shining doors for plaster porches. Gentlemen at the 618, each of a shining key like this strayed one in the wilderness. They yawn into their new sheets. The communique is as much as yesterday. Will you have these, sir? Thanks. Go in and get some sleep. The sergeant's head thrust out from the barn door opening. Mr Jenkins' soldiers hunched. He blames Mr May. Keep them, won't you? Thanks. On addressing commissioned officers, it was his favourite theme. John Ball stood patiently, waiting for the eloquence to spend itself. The tedious flow continued, then broke off very suddenly. He looked straight at Sergeant Snell inquiringly, whose eyes changed queerly, who ducked in under a low entry. John Ball would have followed, but stood fixed and alone in a little yard, his senses highly alert, his body incapable of movement or response. The exact disposition of small things, the precise shapes of trees, the tilt of a bucket, the mo movement of a straw, the disappearing right boot of Sergeant Snell. All minute noises, separate and distinct, in a stillness charged through with some approach and violence, registered not by the ear or any single faculty, an onrushing perversion, sat saturating all existence with exactitude, a logarithmic, dial timed, millesimal of calculated velocity, some mean chemist's contrivance, a stinking physicist destroying toy. He stood alone on the stones, his mess tin spilled at his feet. Out of the vortex, rifling in the air it came, bright, brass shod, pandoran, with an all-filling scream in it, howling crescendos, up-piling snap. The universal world, breath held, one half second, a bludgeon stillness. Then, the pent violence released a consummation of all burstings out, all sudden uprendings and writhings, through all taken out with vents, all barrier breaking, all unmaking, pernitric begetting. The dissolving and splitting of solid things, in which unearthing aftermath John Ball picked his mess tin and hurried within, ashen, huddled, weighted in a dismal straw. Behind E battery, fifty yards down the road, a great many mangolds, uprooted, pulped, congealed with chemical earth, spattered and made slippery on the rigid boards leading up to the emplacement. The sap of vegetables slobbered the spotless breech block of number three gun. Right, despite being quite badly read there, because you can see it's quite complicated like, linguistically and structurally. 
you know, you can see how brilliant that is. You're like thinking, what is that? Two telling the sergeant, they essentially, one of them sent to get some rifles, then they're talking outside, and as they're coming back, they meet John Ball's got, just filled up his mess in the water. The big guy, the officer asked John Ball for a match. John Ball get, goes for a match, but he finds his key from his landlord at home. He's like, what a weird thing. The absolute brilliance of him finding this um, thing from home in his pocket and placing him back there. I will just read that bit again because it's awesome. His chill fingers clumsy at full trouser pocket, scattered on the stones, one flattened candle end, two sometime pieces, pallid silver sixpence, a length of pink orderly rope, room tape, a latch key. The two young men together glanced where it lay incongruous, bright between the sets. Keys of Stondon Park. His father has its twin in his office in Knight Rider Street. Keys of Stondon Park and French farmyard. Stupid bull, it's no use here, so far from its complying lock. Locks for shining doors for plaster porches. Gentlemen of the 618, each with a shining key. Like this strayed one in the wilderness. And essentially they just stood there looking at this key and it's, just, it's awesome because it just takes him back, takes John Bull back and it takes them both out of the moment, back to home, right? And then the next thing that happens their shell. In the First World War they used to call them whiz-bangs, I think. Well, they had different names for the different shells because they could hear them approaching. Some of them you couldn't, you could only hear it when it hits. The whiz-bangs were like, you only heard them like, whiz -bang, like that. And that's essentially what this is um, describing. So when it hits, when it's coming, John Ball stood there with this officer and he's a bit like, he's feeling awkward. On addressing commissioned officers, it was his favourite theme. John Ball stood patiently, waiting for the eloquence to spend itself. The tedious flow continued then broke off very suddenly in that moment, in that very moment, they hear the coming. He looked straight at Sergeant Snell on Quarry, whose eyes changed queerly, who ducked under low entry. John Ball would have followed, but stood fixed and alone in the little yard, his senses highly alert, his body incapable of movement or response. So he's like frozen to the spot, because the first time in this, this is in the end of part two, and uh, before that it's just been chat and he's been meeting, but he, this is the first time that he's had anything happen to him that's like violent takes him out of his kind of innocence, essentially. He senses highly alert, his body incapable of movement or response. The exact disposition of small things, the precise shapes of trees, the tilt of a bucket, the movement of a straw, the disappearing right boot of Sergeant Snell, all minute noises, separate and distinct, in a stillness charged through with some approach and violence, registered not by the ear or any single faculty, but an onrushing pervasion, saturating all existence with exactitude, logarithmic, dial-timed, millesimal of calculated velocity, velocity, some mean chemist's contrivance, a stinking physicist destroying toy. I've, I haven't done it any favours by my bad reading of it. <clears throat> so that's it, that's as it's coming, right? And then he stood alone on the stones, his messing spilled at his feet, so, you know, he's dropped his thing, he's like, he's, he's rigid with fear. And then out of the vortex, rifling to the air, it came bright, brush-shod, Pandoran. Pandoran, amazing. With all filling, screaming, the howling crescendos, up piling snap, the universal world, breath held, one half second of bludgeon stillness. That's that second before it blows up. Then the pent violence released, a consummation of all burstings out, all sudden up rendings and writhing through all taken events, all barrier breaking, all unmaking. I mean, it's absolutely amazing, but I won't, you know, I'm, I'm obviously getting a bit mad over it, but you can see why I like it so much. So that's the first thing I'm going to read here. You could probably say that's in the realms of normal kind of, um, of poetry. I mean, once I read it, I almost want to read the whole thing out, because it just gets better and better. This has already gone on for 23 minutes, so as if anyone's watching this, but if you are, I might have to split this up into, into other sections.